Can I ask what you're up to today? Uh, yeah, so I'm just on shift up at 40 Dean Street, which is an uh, Italian restaurant where I work as a bartender. Oh, okay. How long have you worked there? About uh, two months now. Okay. How do, yeah. you find, how do you find that? It's, it's interesting. It's more intense than I expected. I think it's the first time I've started working in hospitality. It's been like a proper good experience to kind of realise how just how much goes into you know not even just sitting down at a restaurant but like anywhere you go in London essentially there are people working really hard and you just kind of don't really notice it and these people are just kind of like walking past you and it's um to be part of that intensity is pretty cool I don't know I like it and I saw you having a very in-depth conversation with a, with a group of yeah. guys over there we were just talking about racism in, in Britain and I said that many people believe they are superior to other people because they are taught certain things about themselves. But I was saying that, but these things which you're taught are not entirely true. For example, we're taught about Christopher Columbus and he discovered America, but the only thing he discovered were the people already living there. So we're taught many things which aren't true and as someone who personally I, I love mathematics learning about the history of mathematics and where it started is very fascinating to me I think if I knew what I knew about mathematics when I was 16 I would have loved mathematics a lot more because I was told that it came from the Greeks but what we weren't taught is that the Greeks were students of black Africans in Egypt and Ethiopia when I was in school, I was told about the, the kings of England, Henry VIII, William the Conqueror. And when it was talking about black people, they just spoke about slavery. Now, as um, the only black person in my class, that made me feel really bad. Because I was taught about European kings and queens, but about black slaves. And the, sla the history of black people didn't begin in slavery. It's like reading a novel and starting 80% of the way in. That's, that's an injustice. That's not, you're not getting the whole story. Oh, well, i am just been taking part in the pram uh, protest. Though uh, I don't have a pram, but I, uh, I'm just supporting them. And a lot of older people are doing so, I notice. It's not the young mums who are probably busy at home taking care of their children, um, but we are protesting on behalf of the children who are being ig ignored and basically killed because of the um, air pollution and the uh, rising heat and the arid lands in Africa and so on. What prompted you to join this, this movement or this group of people? Well, um, I don't remember quite, it was about five years ago and it had just started up and I was uh, just suddenly filled with despair about the climate emergency and uh, this seemed to be the answer and I thought it would be making a huge impact and indeed it's doing its very best but people are not listening. And I heard that the head of Eton said Boris was a very bright chap, but he had no principles. So, yes, there are no principles for, for the future of life on Earth. It's a nonsense. You've seen my plans. I'm, I'm trusting in technology we don't have, and I'm saying we'll get there by 2050, which some of these science people say it's too late, but it's nonsense, nonsense, stuff and nonsense. My think tank says it's fine. Yes, thank you, thank you, yes. What makes me happy? I think connections with people has always been my thing. I don't know, I'm one of those people who I can definitely sniff out suffering if I want to, you know, I can definitely suffer through any given situation. I could be suffering right now at my job. But at the same time, especially when I start engaging with other people, that's when I really start to see more like, more beauty in life, I guess. If that, uh, if that makes any sense. So do you find, do you think that uh, there have been times in your life where you've been more drawn to the negative side of things? Yeah, certainly, certainly. It's, um, I think I was well practiced in that, you know, kind of brought up in a very 
like working class Tory Thatcherite, the wolf is, wolf is always at the door type household. And my parents are absolutely loving, don't get me wrong. But it was, um, I think growing up, I kind of got this idea that, you know, to look for the negatives is essential to survival. And, um, you know, I feel like, so I'm 27 right now, and you know, in the past five years or so, I've started, starting to learn that that's not necessarily always a strategy that's gonna lead me to feeling like a leader fulfilled life, you know. Because if you're taught that you come from kings and you come from slaves, then automatically you're in a position of power. If I'm, if I'm in school and I'm taught all the world's greatest scientists, mathematicians look like me and you've contributed nothing to society, how's the person who was taught that he's a slave and has contributed nothing, how's he supposed to have any pride? And why would the person that's been told they're amazing, why wouldn't they look down on the person they were taught has nothing but a history of slavery and colonialism? So I can understand why people look down on other people, but the things they're taught are not rooted in reality. But I don't believe racism will go anywhere. Absolutely not, no. And I'm not expecting it to. And I think I'd be a fool to hope for a day when there's no racism. I mean, how do you fight an idea? How do you fight 400 years of um, conditioning? It might take another 400 years to redo, to undo rather, 400 years of programming. But certainly not in this generation. Um, can it go away? I did want to say that I've just got a great grandson who was born this morning and um, I very much fear for his future I really wanted to discourage my granddaughter from having any children, but it seemed cruel and, and you know, I, so I didn't say very much about it. But I know a lot of women are deciding not to have children because of what they face. Anyway, this boy, ah, he'll have support from his parents and at the moment they're earning good wages and so on, but who knows how long it'll be before all this collapses. Is there one event in your life that brought you the most happiness? I, think, I don't think I'll ever be as happy as when I was 10 years old and I won a one and a half kilometre running race and just kind of like well, with my mum there and just kind of the sense of pride and achievement there. That, uh, that really sticks out for me as a kind of like, you know, this is, I did a, I did a thing, you know, I like genuinely feel like 100% content with myself. And, uh, but at the same time, yeah, you know, I'm not always trying to recapture that. I think there is a temptation to always be looking for these kind of, I guess, peak events, you know, like how can I, what about today is going to be like, give me the rush and all of that. And I feel like a steady accumulation of happiness is kind of the goal, but it doesn't take away from the fact that, you know, there are always huge ups and downs. In life. Why do you think you may never have a high like that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that the, the, the degree of, ah, oh, it used to annoy me when people would say this when I was a child, but the degree of innocence to childhood and the kind of simplicity of only really seeing the day ahead of you and not really anything else. But like I say, going back to the connections thing, it's like, you know, everyone I come across in life seems to have this kind of constant like at least consciousness of what might be going wrong um, and you know it, it, it's pessimism perhaps pessimism yeah it's perhaps it's a British thing more so but you know like sometimes I'll see someone cycling down the street um, you know they'll be smiling to themselves and kind of look genuinely at peace and my head will just go oh, oh I hate that and I think part of that is jealousy um, Perhaps all of it is jealousy, you know? Like, really missing that kind of, like I say, like unadulterated sense of, like, joy that one can get, you know? So, uh, I'm going to give you 37. Yeah, times... 42. 1554. 
Well, check. I might be wrong. So check. See, I'll take your word. I, I might, no, don't take my word because I might be wrong. I might be just saying my telephone number. You know. <laughs> there you go. What did I say? You 30? said thirty-seven times forty-two, and I said one five five four. Yeah, that's correct. Right. Yeah. How did I work that out? I didn't guess. What did I do? I I broke. 37, no I didn't, I said 37, 37, no I didn't, 42 is the same as 3 times 7 times 2. So what I did, I multiplied 37 by 3 and I got 111, then I times that by 14 and I got 1554. And is this yeah. using the, this Ethiopian method? Absolutely. Definitely, yeah. And there are many other things that um, the Africans invented for mathematics, which I find totally fascinating. And are they incorporated into, uh, I don't know, the world of mathematics, but they, are they incorporated into modern day mathematics? Well, they are because the Ethiopians invented binary and binary is what powers computers. So without people realizing um, on their mobile phones, the computers are using African mathematics. Hmm. But we're not taught this because I was taught about the Greeks and Mr. Pythagoras. I never knew nothing about the African contribution to mathematics. Yeah. I've never heard of it either. I ne neither did I until I started to do my own research. Never heard about it at all. Yeah. And I think the Ethiopian method makes math so much easier. It's a huge mm. part of uh, African history, which yeah. is just brushed under the carpet would you say ignored ignored yeah. yeah because it's there but it's ignored can i ask uh, on a general level what makes you happy oh dear i don't think i'm often happy why do you not think you're often happy well i i'm just so aware of the threat that's all around us and the way that civilization has gone completely in the wrong direction and is and the way the population is increasing and uh, but I do rather incline to look on the sad side so uh, I was happy when this boy was born for some extraordinary reason I was happy have you always looked on the the negative side of things yes why do you think that is well, my mother was a, a bit of a, um, a, a put-downer, so I think I felt pretty put-down in my youth. Um, and uh, I suppose I haven't found, haven't found a different mood because I got into the habit of this mood. Perhaps you will say that's why I belong to Extinction Rebellion. But there are lots of people with really positive attitudes who belong to Extinction Rebellion. And I, I'm so impressed at the way they keep on keeping on. It's fantastic. I mean, this makes me happy, really, to see. Yes, except I'm crying about it. But that's with emotion when I see the red rebels or the, the grey uh, people who mourn or the black people who say you are killing our children. It's all good stuff. Is there one event in your life that brought you the most unhappiness? I think when I was, uh, when I was 22, I, I'd uh, dropped out of this university and I, I remember just kind of getting the email one day and you know like this is something that my parents have been really proud like I moved out to America I was doing this like big thing and uh, and it didn't work out for me you know it just didn't click together and I think the root of that unhappiness was just kind of shame you know it's just kind of like I wanted to have this one conception of myself present this one version of myself to the world I'm just kind of like I'm this hyper competent 22 year old or whatever and just having that so clearly be like failed to live up to that was really difficult you know it kind of yeah that affected me for a while but um like all other things you know it passes what was your biggest takeaway from that i think 
I think coming back to the connections thing, you know, like there was, I had a lot of, I had uh, a lot of shallow connections out there, but I had no real sense of community. You know, I didn't really show very much of myself to other people. And, you know, people tend to reciprocate, or at least in my experience, you know, if I offer up someone myself, then I get someone else back. And I, without those real connections, I really struggled to get up in the morning and do what it is that I was, quote unquote, supposed to be doing, you know, without that real sense of, maybe it was a lack of identity, I don't know. You know, this is why every time I speak to like my mum or something, I'm like, mum, all this stuff's going wrong. And she's like, yeah, but you're in your 20s. That's how it is, Ollie. And I'm like, okay, yeah. You know, I, c I can almost tell from the perspective that someone who's been through that has, that uh, all of this stuff is necessary, yeah. Connection is really important for you. But and why, why, why do you think that, where do you think that comes from? I think possibly just from experiencing a real lack thereof and kind of not wanting to go back to that place you know like I think growing up but also in my early 20s in my lead teens I, like I was saying didn't really have that strong a connection with anyone in my life and it, it was a really lonely sort of miserable place to be you know like only only really ever showing like part of myself like really trying to hide and uh yeah, I, I really don't want to return there.